uh, good evening to you all and good evening to everybody in the overflow theatres. I think we have four overflow theatres here this evening. It's a real testament to the interest of the theatres to attract across the LSE community and across the wider public. But welcome to you all to the first Global Policy Dialogue, and I'll say more about global policy in a moment. It is, to say the least, for me, a great honour and a privilege this evening to have Amartya Sen with us and to have the chance to introduce him. And he will speak this evening on the weighty theme of global justice. In his new book, The Idea of Justice, published now in paperback, he argues that injustices in the contemporary world include global inequities as well as disparities within nation states. Understanding the demands of justice in each context requires public reasoning. And the challenges of global justice specifically call for global public reasoning. I hardly have to introduce Amartya Sen to you. He is, of course, practically, if not actually, a household name. But if any of you have missed the literature in academic life and its impact in the political world for the last 30 years, let me just briefly, briefly (laughs) remind you that he is Lamont University professor at Harvard, also an honorary fellow at that even more august institution, the London School of Economics. He won a modest prize, the Nobel Prize for Economics, in 1998, and was Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, in 1998 to 2004. His books include Development as Freedom, The Argumentative Indian, Identity and Violence, and now The Idea of Justice, among many other works. It doesn't need me really to say that his work has had a profound influence, not just on academic debates and (coughs) economics, politics, political philosophy, international relations, but has a wider, substantial, practical impact. (coughs) Briefly, a word from our sponsors, as it were, Global Policy. Global Policy is a new LSE journal, I think an innovative interdisciplinary journal, bringing together world-class academics and practitioners to analyze global, public, and private solutions to challenging problems and questions. If you haven't heard about Global Policy, you should look at its website. It's globalpolicyjournal.com. That's one word, globalpolicyjournal.com. Someone recently said of the website that it's so sexy they ought to have to register somewhere that you're over the age of 18 in order to proceed. (laughs) And when I said this recently at a lecture to several hundred students, I noticed that within the 24 hours that followed, there were over 300 hits. (laughs) I wonder whether they were looking for public policy discussions or something else. This evening's event has three parts. Uh, Amartya Sen will speak first for some 20 minutes. Then I will ask him some questions that occurred to me when reading his magnum opus, and then the floor is yours. At 8 o'clock, we will finish, and I would ask you all to remain seated while Samatia Sen and I leave the theatre. That's so he can position himself outside to sign books if any of you wish to purchase books or have books you've already purchased signed by him personally. So it remains for me just to ask you all to give Amartya Sen an extremely warm welcome. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be back at LSE. I've spent many extremely happy years teaching here. I see uh, some of my old colleagues here. I've also many, many new faces. And every time I come back at LSE, it's always a real delight. So um, thank you very much for David. You, you turned my, your back on me, but I'm <laughs> thanking you at this moment. Yeah, the um, global justice is what I think is announced as a subject I was going to talk about. Um, and these are meant to be mainly informal observations. <clears throat> the, I think the two kinds of barriers to global justice, the pursuit thereof, as it were, uh, come from rather different ends, but they're ultimately linked. Uh, one is a kind of lack of commitment. By the way, am I audible? 
Uh, I am, okay, all right. Um, one is a kind of uh, lack of commitment to do things uh, beyond your borders and look to the world as a whole, um, rather than your neighborhood, uh, your nations, and, uh, and so on. It's an old subject that goes back to um, really quite classical discussions in all kinds of literatures in the West as well as uh, India, China, um, Middle East, and so on. Um, the, um, it's also, by the way, the subject matter of uh, the Gospel according to Luke, uh, Jesus discussing who is your neighbor. The Good Samaritan story is about uh, what, the, what your obligations are and how to see people who are not your neighbor, but uh, what is your relation with them. The other is the, is, is the role of reasoning as opposed to commitment as to whether you understand what the challenge of global justice really is. And my book is really mostly concerned with the, with the latter, but there is a connection, I think, with the former too. Um, my book is a book on the idea of justice, as the title says, it's really concerned with theory of justice. But basically, there is a kind of contrast in the, in the world of European enlightenment in 18th century between two lines of reasoning, one line of reasoning about justice, uh, which actually begins a little earlier in 17th century with Thomas Hobbes, and it's concerned with uh, an approach to justice which can be called the social contract approach. Um, the, its concern is to find an ideal, um, ideally just state of affairs, but even that is not exactly right. Basically, ideal sets of institutions, ideally just set of institutions. It has three features. One, it's a contract that would be arrived at by the citizens of a sovereign state, so it might be by the very characterization and construction, it's close to the citizenry of a nation. It's also concerned with um, perfection as opposed to removing injustice and making things better. So it begins at a very high level, some might say, and there would be some truth in it, though I didn't use that word uh, in that form, uh, namely utopianism, namely what would it be like, the world, perfectly just world. The, and not particularly, not only that in general form, but ideal, what are the ideally just institutions. That's the form the issue of justice was raised by Hobbes. He began actually not there. He began with human lives, being nasty, brutish, and short. But then ended up actually with an approach which is institutional, which is perfectionist, and which is very deeply national. And that's a line that is pursued by John Locke and, um, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Immanuel Kant, too, excepting he has other elements in his very broad range of theorizing. Um, and the present-day theories of justice are inheritors of that tradition. And it's concerned with just those issues, within nation, perfection, and institutions. On the other hand, there's another line of reasoning, and to which I see my work belonging, um, uh, that's um, very much um, uh, pursued by Adam Smith, in his, particularly in the theory of moral sentiment, but also in the Wealth of Nations and his lectures on jurisprudence, which um, the theory of moral sentiment, by the way, was published 250 years ago in 1759, and last year we celebrated its, um, its 250th anniversary, and I had the privilege of writing a long introduction for that in the Penguin Anniversary Edition, which actually published in New York, hasn't, I think, been published in London yet, but hopefully it will be sometime. The, uh, that approach is concerned with identifying injustices, and see how we might remove them. But see, he's not alone. There's on one side mathematical reasoning coming from people like 
um, Marky de Condorcet, the inventor, the really the original um, founder of social choice theory, a subject in which I spent a lot of my life, um, and, and very much pioneered by a French mathematician. But it's concerned with ranking, how could to make things better. Not so much concerned with the perfection and superlative, it's concerned with comparatives. And I think the most neglected philosopher, perhaps of all times, namely Mary Wollstonecraft, also writing in the 18th century, wrote extensively on identifying injustices. Two that she particularly concerned her where one was the existence of slavery and the other was the subjugation of women. And these, of course, issues she pursued with a great deal of vigor, and which I use quite a lot in my, my book. Now, as it happened, the contemporary theories of justice, John Rawls, which by, by a long margin the greatest political philosopher of our time, is very much a social contract tradition. But even though the exact theories are very different, so are the other theories of justice, Ronald Dworkin, Robert Nozick. They differ in all kinds of substantive ways, but they also take the same um, problematique, namely the, the, idea, the attempt to find out ideal institutions. Um, so perfectionism combined with institutionalism, and actually within a state. And the, in some ways, what I'm trying to do in the book is to pursue the other line to the contemporary world. So there is a fair amount of work that's contemporary that's reflected in it, including from mathematical social choice theory, not a particularly mathematical form, but the lessons thereof. And that leads to a rather different way of thinking about the world. Now, how does it all relate to global justice? Well, by construction, of course, the social contract approach tends to leave out the issue of global justice, and not surprisingly, Tom Nagel, uh, a, a one of our great philosophers, actually, and a wonderfully humane human being, too, also wrote uh, why, in his view, global justice was a chimera, because justice is the kind of thing that happens through a social contract within a sovereign state. And there's no global sovereign state, and therefore no global justice. Yes, demands of humanitarianism. But of course, when people agitate about injustice in the world, and even though anti-globalization people um, say that they're protesting against globalization, what they're really protesting against is injustice and inequality in the world. They're not asking for humanitarian handouts. They are actually asking for more, more justice. And they speak to Smith, though they may not be like speaking pro, they may not be aware that they are speaking, speaking Smith a lot of the time, um, and Mary Wilson Craft and others. So there is that. But Smith also made a particularly important point that you can't really bring in impartial views from within your neighborhood. Not only those whose interests are affected by, but anybody. First of all, people whose interests are affected could be far away. Among other things, Smith used his line of reasoning to criticize early British Empire as to why, as he put it, his conclusion was why East India Company was utterly, in, utterly incapable of running any territory. That was based on a critique where the interests of others are involved, which are not part of the sovereign state of Britain. But it also, even if when their interests are not involved, you would like to listen to their point of view because you may be trapped in parochialism. As an example, he gave the fact that Athenians and ancient Greeks thought no problem, there was no problem in infanticide because they didn't know of any society, though some did exist even at that time, without infanticide, and they thought it's quite necessary for the survival of the society. Now, that was a mistake, and Smith thought that if you brought in people whose experiences are different and views are different, you would liberate yourself from parochialism. So I think both these lines of reasoning, how are the interests of people affected, 
and how can the views and the perspective of others liberate you from your own parochialism becomes very relevant. It's, it's a very contemporary debate. The American Supreme Court has been going on debating whether any experience other, any argument and any experience other than that of America could be, could be brought into the story. And indeed, uh, Justice Scalia, and what was then minority and now is in fact the majority of the Supreme Court, uh, because the, um, the new Chief Justice, um, Justice Roberts, certainly takes the view that the non-American perspective should not be brought, brought in. So it's very much a closed impartiality view. Um, it's very odd in some ways because it's the, it's the Supreme Court that being asked to restrict itself only to, to American argument uh, on grounds that it's an American Supreme Court. On the other hand, in the construction of the uh, American Constitution, experiences of Europe came into it in a very heavy way. And in the American public debate, uh, they're often open-minded enough to listen to foreigners. Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Jesus Christ, uh, lots of foreigners whose point of view gets regular airing uh, in America. But you don't, you, I don't think you could cite Jesus Christ in, the, in an argument in the, in the Supreme Court. So I think um, that's a debate, so that's an interesting debate that's going on. So many ways, uh, the debates about global justice, both in terms of interest interdependence and uh, perspective um, interdependence um, are very relevant to issues of global justice and where this contrast that I'm trying to draw, I believe, that's my, um, my belief, is, uh, is quite important. So that's what the, the book is about. And I think, um, I don't know whether I might not have done 20 minutes, but would you forgive me for stopping there and then we can have chat? Okay, thank you. <laughs> going to sit down in a minute, but I just thought I'd ask the first question standing up, because I, I just wanted to make a general point before I ask a question, and then I'll come and join you. There are three thoughts that occur when reflecting on your magnum opus, and it certainly is a magnum opus. The first is that you're not providing an argument self-evidently about the nature of a perfect justice, as you say, but rather an argument about how we can begin to identify and come to terms with injustice. The second thought is that throughout your book, you question the idea of justice, where V is capitalized or italicized. You question that there is the idea of justice because you accept that there are a plurality of principles of justice that can withstand criticism and that we must remain open to a comparative and critical account of these. And then thirdly, you argue for the advancement of justice and just causes, placing democracy at the center of this development. I'm about, I'll sit down in just a second. So here's my first question, and it would be interesting to have your reflections on it. The first question goes to the heart of uh, my considerations of your book, and it concerns the title. I wonder whether the book should have been called The Idea of Democracy. Why? Um, because in rejecting the contractarian view, the transcendental institutionalism approach associated with Rawls and others, and in championing what you call the realization-focused comparative approach, you emphasize again and again the importance of open public reasoning based on sound information and the careful scrutiny of evidence. Your argument seems to be that given the limits of a Rawlsian type approach to justice, and the fact that there is always a plurality of principles of justice that can sustain critical scrutiny, we must deploy a process of open public reasoning for which we could reach agreement about our priorities and principles. What seems to matter in the end is public reasoning about justice achieved through democracy or government by discussion, as you call it. So that is my first yeah. Well, it's a very interesting question. I'm going to take my tie off since I've, given, I've, given, my, since I've given my lecture anyway now. I, 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 I should point... I, should, that I do have a tie. Yes, I, 
I, I should point out that I came in for criticism earlier when I met Professor Sen. He looked at me and said, you're not wearing a tie. <laughs> and I invited well, because him... Because I put it on in his honour, you see. <laughs> yeah. Over to you. OK. Well, I, I, I think that's a very interesting question, David. Um, I think two things I'd say here. Um, well, three, really. First, the, that the idea of democracy being public reasoning is quite a central proposition in the book. Um, but the book is not concerned only with that. It's concerned also about theories of justice as such. It's concerned with Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and Kant and Rawls and Dworkin and, and Nozick and Gautier and, and lots of other people. Um, so I, if I call the idea, the idea of democracy, it would have been um, part of the book, not all of it. Secondly, the idea that democracy is public reasoning is not mine at all. Uh, you might say that even on the idea of justice, I'm drawing on others, yes, but I'm developing them more substantively. The, I always thought that it was John Stuart Mill, but then some research indicated that it wasn't John Stuart Mill who first used the expression um, democracy being government by discussion. He made that perspective understood and famous, but it's, um, you know, the English always pronounce right one way or pronounce it differently. What I used in Calcutta thought of is called beige hot, but I now gather it's called bucket or something like that. I was the first guy to say that. But that's what it is. That's the part of, there are three chapters of democracy. And three out of 18 is just about the weight of democracy. That in the book is very important, but it's very central. And the third thing is that the idea of democracy is not just on, only about justice either. There's a kind of overlap, but there's also something different in it. Ultimately, democracy has to take decisions, even when there is no agreement. Now, in the case of justice, you can have the con saying, look, on grounds of justice, you cannot resolve this issue. And there are lots of cases then. We could agree that slavery was bad earlier, and, and, and this, that, and other, and people dying of absence of medicine, when medicine can be produced cheaply and is not produced um, and not delivered, is injustice. And even though we agree, ultimately what should be the balance of liberty or as opposed to economic inequality, there would be disagreement among reasonable people. But you know, a point comes when democracy has to make use of other means, which are also in some ways impartial means. And voting is one example of that voting particularly after a lot of public discussion so that liberty is aired in that. So I think it has to go beyond justice. So in some ways, democracy and justice have a lot of overlap, and to that extent, I accept the point you're making is exactly right. But there's something of justice which is not concerned only with democracy, theory of justice, and something in the theory of democracy which is not concerned only with justice. Thank you. Let me just push you to, a, not really, just to, is to take up another issue then, which also is part of a concern with the, if you like, the beyond justice arguments and the central role of what we might call deliberative democracy in, your, in, your, in these writings. Um, so my second question concerns the last part of your book, in which you emphasize the importance of broadening the base of public reasoning about justice. Um, you clearly have in mind an extension of the discursive arenas beyond borders, or to use you know, words that I would use in my own work, the extension of the democratic dialogue from the local to the global is central, to, seems to be central to what you're arguing. This is partly what you mean by open impartiality. But how can we do this? Aren't you perhaps paradoxically just now another European voice? What if cultures and countries and regions refuse this kind of deliberative democratic reasoning government by discussion, as seems to be the case in much of the Middle East, China, and elsewhere. Um, okay. <laughs> um, let me um, um, first say that um, to describe me as a, um, as a European offshoot um, is rather arrogant for, for Europe in its culture. <laughs> when 
Giordano Bruno was being burnt at the stake in Campo di Fiori in Rome. Akbar, a Muslim king in India, was lecturing on the need for religious tolerance. Yeah. And these from different perspectives and different points of view. Uh, the record of Middle East in running from Cordoba in 9th century to Iraq and later the Turkish Empire, which was in much more tolerant of religious diversity than any Christian empire at that time, uh, I think indicates that that is a post-Enlightenment reading of Europe which doesn't go far enough. And I discuss in the book quite a lot about early Indian thought on the subject. I could have done the same thing in Chinese thought about the subject. I don't think it has, the divisions have come regionally sequestered. And I think what I'm doing is, but you're right that there is a contrast. There are people in Europe and elsewhere who are quite intolerant of others. After all, it is Europe that killed six million people during the First World War, and that's only count the Jews without counting the gypsies yet. And I don't think any non-European country had been able to match even Rwanda tried hard, but didn't get quite that far, and was about a million. So I think it's a, there is an intolerant point of view, an impatient point of view, but it's not a European, Asian, European, African distinction, not like that at all. But, but the question remained therefore still significant. What if people don't listen to reasoning? And I think this is where it is important to ask, what would they say when you say, look, this is reason, what do you think? If there, somebody if somebody were to say, I don't believe in reasoning, I'm not run into them. They will give you some reason, usually a very bad reason. <laughs> and the remedy of bad reasoning is good reasoning. But, you know, I think it was actually Akbar who makes that point quite strikingly, saying the reason why reason is supreme, he's arguing that why he's a Muslim, that's his fate. But he would have been wrong because he just accepts it without reasoning. He thought about it, he actually, we know that he, uh, he, he varied his, his loyalties for a while. But then ultimately came down to the view that he wanted to remain a Muslim, but a very liberated Muslim, very little of Sharia in it. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and indeed, um, 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 uh, very good use of the Quran, but he's also very interested in listening to Hindus of different kinds, including the early Sikhs who were classified as Hindus at that time, uh, Jesuits, Parsis. Uh, so he was very open-minded in, in listening to them. But he thought that there was nothing wrong with being Muslim and that, and he thought that the fact that there is nothing wrong with that is a position he arrived at by reasoning. But what he says there is that the difficulty is that even in denying reasoning, we have to give some reason for why you're denying it. You say, why don't you believe in reason? They say, oh, I'll tell you why I don't believe it. And there you are actually trapped in giving a reason for your not using reason. So it's not easy to escape. Now, um, um, I think Tom Nagel's book, I've forgotten now whether it's called The Final Point or something like that, The End Point, it also makes that argument, and makes it, of course, much more philosophically sophisticated way. But the primitive expression of that you see already in Akbar Nama by Abu Fazl discussing conversations with Akbar. With Akbar. So I would say that we have, at the two points I'm making is not a Europe Asia distinction. Sure. And secondly, while there is a contrast, the way to handle it is to recognize that people who reject what what we might regard as good reasoning, tend to, don't say, I give you no reason. They give very bad reasons, and then you have to get into it. And that is the point, I mean, that's in a sense is what the Smithian thing is. I mean, he asked the question, why would Aristotle and Plato defend infanticide? Because they have got so used to the idea that no society could survive without it. So then the argument would be, could a society survive without it? As it happened, even though the picture changed a lot later, there existed Asian societies at that time which didn't allow infanticide, whereas ancient Greek did. So I think um, there is a real issue about um, engaging in argument with people who 
say that I don't want to reason. And you know, it's not the case that even when you, when people say that, look, um, I, I don't want to uh, listen to argument uh, because this is my faith, I'll do it. And then you could ask the question, I would like, why is it your faith? Why do you think it's your duty to do it? Now, it is possible that somebody might say, I won't agree. And what is the, the, the minimal claim that the book is making is that justice is something on which you could reason and anyone could participate in it, and the position that you arrive at on the basis of reasonable argument is, uh, has a claim which others don't. But at the same time, um, there is the hope also that you can trap more and more people into that. I just wonder, though, I mean, this makes essential the issue of good and bad reasoning. But isn't the challenge of politics not so much between good and bad reasoning, although good and bad reasoning is clearly a critical issue in politics, but different kinds of good reasoning or different kinds of reasoning? If you think of the breakdown of the Copenhagen negotiations, the stalemate in the Doha trade round, the limits of progress on financial market, global financial market regulation, the questions around nuclear proliferation and the renewal of the non-nuclear proliferation treaty, the pe- arguments that are being had there surely are not between non-arguers who refuse to enter the realm, in each and every case, uh, good and bad arguments. They're about weighting different arguments differently. And thereby, you may not get you know, a simple deliberative result in the sense that yeah. you argue for. Yeah. I hope you don't weight the different kind of arguments, giving the bad argument some weight, but a little weight, and good arguments a lot more weight. I think you have to reject the bad argument in favor of a good one. And I think that's the way the debates went. Let me take up the particular examples. Yeah, please. Um, let me take three. Um, Copenhagen, you mentioned. I think Copenhagen was an absolute poster child for what happened if you don't have reasoning. You see, I, I kept on hearing from my European friends in particular, and this is an area where there are many areas where Americans make more mistakes than Europeans, Iraq being one of them, but um, Iraq intervention, that is. But this is the area where the Europeans were enormously more um, um, ambitious, without reasoning. And there were serious issues being raised. Um, the Chinese were concerned that um, um, the Europeans and Americans have polluted the world altogether for a long, long time. Why wouldn't they be allowed to pollute a little bit now? Uh, The Indians, after some hesitation, came round to that point of view, um, and the Brazilians, too. Um, What the Europeans went on saying, no, no, it's very important right now. But you see, I think part of the debate got trapped in in what looked like retribution. The great insight that we learned from uh, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela is that when you're dealing with past injustice, especially in this case committed by people who didn't even know what they were committing, what the impact of industrial, it, uh, no one could have thought in, in Manchester in, in, in early 19th century uh, what the impact of all those smokes might be on, on, on global warming and on the ozone layer and so on. So the, the, but the, the Tutu Mandela line was just forget the past turn a page on that, but bear in mind that the impact of the past remains with us today. The position to power occupied by white people. So similarly today, an unusually high proportion of the global commons are occupied by Europeans and Americans. And there the Chinese and the Indians and Brazilians have a case. Where they don't have any case at all is not to give any least listening this is all about new polluters and old polluters. There are non-polluters there, namely much of Africa, which haven't polluted anything and, uh, yet, but they have to industrialize at some stage. And when they industrialize, and they will have to pollute some, because that is the nature of the game. So you need some balancing of that. And even the G20 hadn't got their representation, hardly any, actually, South Africa and Nigeria, very atypical countries. And, and the other developing countries didn't speak up for them. So I think what we needed is much greater reasoning on this. And then on that basis, we could have arrived at a contract. But the fact that we didn't get a contract wasn't because 
reasoning was resisted, but there wasn't really a, enough reasoning. That was people going straight at the contract without the reasoning that's needed before that. If you take the kind of debate going on in America now, turning the other side, say National Health Service, when why did Obama have such difficulty introducing? People were rejecting it. Because Americans are very prone to, to be angry with what they describe as socialized medicine. And they're terrified of it. I believe some American mothers even feed, uh, even make their children eat broccoli and spinach by threatening them with socialist me socialized medicine <laughs> as an alternative. But it couldn't go as a simple threat. What they do is they have to construct a story, a story, and that's what the Tea Parties, etc., bring out. That there are these, as they say, death panels, and your grandmother sent by National Health Service to death, and so on. Now, these are untrue, and therefore, arguments based on those factual presumptions are bad arguments. But there are arguments made. So there are arguments made, they are imminently discussable, and I believe rejectable. What is a pity, actually, is that the public engagement battle, which Obama handled so well during election, seemed to have deserted him by the time he was in, in the White House. Uh, and I mean, he still gave good speeches, uh, and pretty much all his speeches, other than the environmental one after, after the, uh, the, the uh, BP uh, disaster, were, were terrific speeches. But I think the mechanism was really gone, and the Republicans won that. But I think it's that argument that we have to return to. I could have said a little bit about other things, but I think okay. these are enough examples. <laughs> I want to ask you just two more questions, and then we'll yes. open it to the audience. Sure. And my third thought goes something along the lines of this. You argue that we are unable to rank various social arrangements or social realizations, as you put it, if we start by saying justice is. And yet you repeatedly refer in your book to your own theory of justice, which surely also is a kind of justice is. Is this not a contradiction? It would be a contradiction if what you said were true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. The book isn't about justice is. It's to say that it's the subject matter of justice is in the context of practical reason, and that is good old-fashioned name for political philosophy. Yeah. Uh, practical reason is the removal of injustice. That's what the subject matter of justice is. And it doesn't require you to say this is justice. It's required to say how would you go about reasoning about what is irremediable injustice. And that's what the book is about. And the, um, the agreement that you're seeking would not be on, on uh, what perfect, what justice is, is. Um, in fact, um, you know, I think this is a fairly elementary mathematical point that having identified a perfectly just state doesn't help you to rank things at all. No way. I mean, you think of two guys, one ranks three states, X, Y, Z, in that order, and the second ranks it as X, Z, Y they agree on a perfectly just state, namely X. How does it help them to resolve between Y and Z? Because that told both of them are consistent with Y being above Z or Z being above Y. So justice is, is not only not necessary, not only not something on which we can expect to get an agreement, uh, it's, it's, sorry, I meant it is not only not needed, but uh, in, 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 in that form, but it wouldn't actually help necessarily in that mathematical sense. It would not help if you knew, knew it either. It not necessary, not sufficient, it's not helpful. Uh, it, is it exciting? Yes, it's quite exciting. Is there a role for what justice is? Yes, I, I, I would agree there is. It's a, it, it has a hugely inspirational role. And I think yesterday I was in a different meeting where I had to give this example so I will um, uh, take the liberty of doing that again. If I'm involved in the French Revolution and trying to, to raise the masses and shouting down with the second drawbridge or whatever it is they said outside the Bastille on that fateful day, I would say 
liberty, equality, and fraternity without qualification. I would not say enhancement of liberty, reduction of inequality, and somewhat greater cultivation of fraternity. <laughs> I don't think I will be able to get the second drawbridge down with that statement. So it does have a point. It is an inspirational point. I don't go against it at all. But we have to distinguish between a theory and an inspiration. Okay, very good. And my last question is about the role of uh, how you conceive political philosophy as a discipline in the social sciences. I just wonder how you see the discipline of political philosophy changing if we accept your call for this more comparative approach. Uh, what about the social sciences? Do you see political philosophy in the social sciences then as increasingly sort of two sides of a common endeavour? Um, yes, I, I do. That in general I do, absolutely. But you know, a different parts of social sciences are imprisoned in different dead talks. Uh, I think political philosophy, ideally, particularly political philosophy of justice, is very much imprisoned under social contract tradition. Yeah. Economists make made their mistake, but this is not what they do. They're very concerned with ranking, and everyone, and uh, you know, is being involved with with that. Welfare economics is all about ranking. Uh, social welfare functions are about ranking. So that's not a debate I have to have with the economist. The debates in the economist which I do have in the book is when it comes to the nature of rationality, which also feeds into a theory of justice. There I think political philosophers used, I was going to say get it more right, they used to get it right until the economist sold them that rational choice theory <laughs> is the best way of understanding it. And now there's an oddity, I mean I was attacking that, it wasn't called that at that time, in my inaugural lecture at LSE in 1972, I spoke about that. It was called by something else at that time. But then the economists were all very convinced on that. And then gradually, economists have gotten out, got, got out of it, mainly because of the advent of experimental reasoning and, 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 and behavioral economics. People don't seem to behave the way that that kind of rationality is allowed to predict. But meanwhile, rational choice theory captured is what is now called rational choice politics and law and economics. And while the mother subject has lost that, it's uh, not entirely lost, but, uh, but is losing it rapidly, I think political philosophy and as new converts at the, uh, and, 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 and law and economics is still all guns in that direction. So that's their problem. But I think the particular issue of uh, superlativism, relativism as opposed to comparatism, isn't a big problem for economists in general. Okay, thank you. Well, I'd now like to open the, the, the discussion up to the audience. Uh, we often take questions in clusters, you know, get two or three views at least out. Mm. Are you happy for that, or would you prefer just to have one I have a big, You are the boss, you'll decide. <laughs> I am the boss tonight. Yeah. All right, so we've got mics, and uh, 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 let us take questions. Where, where, will, where shall I start? I'm going to stand up just to make sure I can see people. Yes, gentleman with his hand. Perhaps you could just briefly say who you are and then proceed. Hi, I'm Matthew. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the idea of ideology and its relation to free will. I'm thinking particularly in terms of cultural traditions or mass media. How can do you, you hold it closer? Sure, sorry. Um, should I start again? Perhaps you should stand up. No, okay. no, no. no. <laughs> go, go ahead from where you are. I wanted to ask you about the role of ideology, um, how it relates to free will, and I'm thinking in terms of the culture industry, as you might put it. How do you see strong global narratives that are projected through perhaps large media organizations or established trends impacting on individuals' contributions to public reasoning and public discourse? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. The, the word ideology has been used in quite two different senses. One is a kind of neutral sense, namely what are the kind of basic approach of ideas that you happen to have on something. And the other is a somewhat pejorative sense, which is quite common in Marxian literature. Ideology is something which imprisons you and from which you are seeking liberation. Um, I take it you're asking the question in the former sense, broader sense, or the latter too. 
Well, if, if, if it's the latter, it's very easy to answer. If you're captured in some kind of a false belief, either because of false consciousness, to use Marxian term again, um, then ought to, what you ought to do is to liberate yourself from it as sooner the better, as you say. Um, on the other hand, if by ideology you mean the, the general approaches, I think they are very important in constructing our argument, in raising our issues. Actually, Smith and Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiment at some stage said, our first response to any issue um, of, of, of good and bad are all instinctive. And so the extent that ideas come in, I don't think he uses the word ideology, but he is talking about ideology in that sense. But then comes the need for reasoning. And in some ways, I think he's going beyond where David Hume would leave it, leave it saying that ultimately you cannot defeat reasoning, uh, 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 sentiments uh, by reasoning. Though uh, David Hume is not entirely consistent on that in the sense that he also says uh, that uh, at other places that you could. Smith was quite clear that reasoning could address these issues. And ultimately, it would still be a matter of sentiment, but sentiment which take into account the reasoning that have come into it. So ideology plays a very big part in this. If public reasoning is important, ideology will come into it. If you think about now, if you want to, I mean, Rawls discusses public reasoning very well. I learned a great deal from him within the country. I learned a great deal from Habermas. But these are all primarily within a, a, a society, within a country. But if you take there, there the argument that come will be influenced by ideology, but then they encounter each other. In the process, your ideology might shift. But ideology has a kind of algorithmic role in getting the debate started and pursuing it. So I think ideology will continue to remain very important in the, in the, in the former sense, as opposed to the mistaken belief, false belief sense. And uh, I, th I think that simply is something which we should recognize to be important. But that doesn't mean that we can't use reasoning. Mary Calder. Hello, this was just a follow-up on the last question. Where are you, Mary? I'm here. Hi. Okay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just a follow-up on the last question, because I think, in a way, what the question was, where's the space for public reasoning in a world which is dominated by CNN, Al Jazeera, uh, all these images, is there a place where we can have public reasoning according to conscience? I think that was... Yeah. I think we're having public reasoning all the time. We're not having as much public reasoning as we would want. But you see, there too, I'm not a perfectionist. I don't say don't have any reasoning until you can have perfectly good reasoning. And, you know, the fact you mentioned Al Jazeera, um, they have brought in a new, lot of new perspectives. As a matter of fact, a man called Riz Khan is, is going to interview me for an hour, I gather, on Saturday on the subject, and I'm sympathetic to the fact that, that they have brought in a lot of other perspectives. But that's the way the debate continues, and the broader we can make it, the better. You see, the real difficulty with perfectionism is that you can make... It, I know that that's not your position, Mary, since I know your position, <laughs> but, and, but I'm taking your question to illustrate my argument, that there was a time when UNESCO went um, completely bonkers, really. Uh, it's not an unusual position for UNESCO to be in, <laughs> but this is, uh, this is probably the extreme that I know when the, the UNESCO Director General decided that since there was unequal division of news coverage and Western news agencies did all the coverage, most of the coverage, it would be best to ban the news being covered by the Western agencies about Africa and so on. So about the only bit of information that were coming in were to be choked off. Now the point was certainly right that you need broadening and therefore Al Jazeera is a contribution and I wish there should be many more contributions. To a great extent, CNN was actually inspired by that. It happened, I know, Ted Turner quite well, uh, both as an um, activist in one of his foundations, namely the Nuclear Threat Initiative, 
that he set up with um, with his Sam Nunn about how to prevent nuclear uh, holocaust in the world. But uh, having come to know well, I recognize when we talked about how he began and so on, it was very much a question of bringing in a perspective, bringing in perspectives which are not Americans alone. In fact, one of the things that's not widely known, as said, is very proud of that, that he personally told to the newscaster and said that we do not use the word foreigner here because there's no such thing as a foreigner. You could say Americans, you could say Europeans, you could say African, but not foreigner. And I, I think there was a vision there. So in many ways, the world has moved, I and mean, certainly the world that we live in today is dramatically different from the world that I encountered here when I came here in 1953, and where, you know, the news, news coverage was limited and very much more. Uh, limited by the way it comes from. Does it require a lot of improvement? Yes. And that's why you do what you do, I do what you do, David Hill does what he does. And I think that's the direction to look at, not to kick at what we have, but to try to see how we can broaden it, enhance it. Thank so you. thanks for letting me say those things. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> There's a question right over in the left-hand corner here. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Juliet Michelson from the New Economics Foundation. Um, I think actually my question follows on very much from what you've just said, no such thing as a foreigner, because I wanted to ask you what the role of empathy is in... in what the role of empathy. empathy? Empathy in the role yeah. of um, forming an, an idea of justice, because, of course, um, if the, the Rawlsian notion of a veil of in ignorance does away with the need for, for empathy because you don't need to know which individual you're going to to need to empathize with, but is merely being exposed to other people's perspectives enough? Um, we might nowadays know more about what other people have to say, but if we don't take them seriously as fully formed human beings with the same experiences, emotions, thoughts as, as us and the people like us, then is that a barrier? Yeah, Thank it's you. again a very interesting question. Um, let me say three things in response to it. First of all, I don't personally use the word empathy. You won't find the word empathy in my book, Idea of Justice, mainly because I don't quite know what exactly it means. I do understand what sympathy means, because that's been a good English word for quite a long time, and we do understand it. Empathy, you know, maybe I'm missing out something, and someday I will start empathizing with empathy. But... <laughs> Right at this moment, I haven't got to that phase yet. So that's the first point. But second, what you said is exactly right. Just take out empathy and put sympathy. What Rawls says in the context is that you have to sympathize with people without who they are, in, and that's the original position as contractors as such for that purpose. That is impartiality, which is done. Sympathy is not the only thing, but sympathy is a very big part of that. Now, however, that original position is only for the members of the citizens of your country. So if that is defining the boundaries of your sympathy, it is what I call in my book a closed impartiality. The difference between the original position of Rawls, where you have to take that impartial view with other fellow citizens of your country, and impartiality view of Smith, Smith is saying that that's just not adequate. You have to bring in the perspectives of people very far away. How are they affected? What do they think? What does it look like to them? So the issue of sympathy, and he uses the word, um, can be much more broadened than it finds expression within the boundaries of a, of a nation state. And the third thing is that the it is not the case that, you, that I'm unrealistic enough to believe that sympathy for people far away is just as easy as sympathy for your neighbor that you know. And that's where I think um, two points I would say here. And one is, um, well, one I already referred to, I mean, even though I do want to emphasize um, um, yes, that I'm completely non-religious. Uh, my wife, Emma, was very wise when I was often quoting Buddha and saying that people always tend to believe that you're a Buddhist. 
And I said, well, I am very influenced by him. But I'm going to call, call Jesus Christ now again, namely on the subject of what I say about Samaritan. It actually ends by, how does it end? He's arguing with a lawyer, and the lawyer has said that you do have a duty to your neighbor, and who is your neighbor, the guys who live around there. And Jesus said, let me tell you a story. And that's a good Samaritan story, and that the and the, the, the Levite and the priest crosses the street uh, and doesn't help. Uh, my, um, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, I know of people who think that the real mistake was having to cross the street because they did nothing wrong. They should have got right past without helping. But that's not the position that Jesus takes because he applauds the fact that the Samaritan does help. But he doesn't end by saying, is the Samaritan better than the priest? No. He says that, who would you describe as the neighbor of the wounded man? And the lawyer then concedes that, I suppose he would have to say that it is the Samaritan who is his neighbor, which is exactly the point Jesus is making. Neighborhood is not necessarily defined by closeness. The second thing I would like to uh, 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 site is the is a, is a little um, fairly unknown paper um, uh, by well not unknown been reproduced but not much used in the theory of justice by David Hume uh, written in 1730 uh, about um, almost 30 years ago before um, uh, theory of moral sentiment uh, a paper uh, essay called on justice where he says that you know um, it is easy for us to ignore other people whom we don't know anything about. But as our relationship expands, and he's talking about the early globalization of trade, we come to know people, we have relationship with them, it becomes increasingly impossible for us not to take that into account. So the boundaries of justice ever go wider. That's his conclusion. So I think while it is possible for us to ignore lots of people, one reason why the, what the news media, and the, coming back to Mary's question, uh, what we are discussing then does, is that it not only that it brings in different perspectives, it makes you aware of the existence of lots of people, their concern, their pain, their humiliation, the way their lives are going. And that itself is a contribution to the idea of justice and is the practice of justice. So that's the way I would answer your question. And if that, all that fits into empathy, then wonderful. I'm happy to do. Thank you. There's a question at the top, halfway you. up the left. Thank you. Francesca Clark from here. Where are you? I'm here. Francesca Clark okay, from the yeah. LSE. First of all, thank you very much for giving us so much to think about, Professor Sen. Thank My you. question is also about the use of words, about terminology. Uh, I'm aware that the term justice historically um, has been used very much in the sense that you have used it in this discussion. But in modern discourse, very often now, both nationally and internationally, the term justice tends to be associated with the law and with law courts in particular. So I'm curious as to know why you've used the term justice rather than fairness and what you think to be the essential... Rather difference. than what? Fairness. Why you use the term justice, justice as opposed to fairness. fairness. And what Sorry, you, I'm not getting the word. The, 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 What's the, the alternative to justice? Fairness is the art. Why you use the term justice rather than the term fairness? And what are, oh, how do you think spell of the, the last word? F fair. <laughs> oh, yeah, me. I think. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm not familiar with that word. Is this fairness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, I understand. Not uh, used in this context. Well, yeah. maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. if you're not familiar with it, it will be a hard question to answer. But my question was, what do you think is the essential different between them, because they're often used interchangeably in modern discourse, other than in the context of the law, where you will see the term justice consistently used. Thanks. Yeah. Um, let me say three things here again. One is that the, word, the fact that the word justice is used in many different ways is um, very important and has to be recognized. And indeed, in my book, I actually quote Adam Smith saying that. And to say that you have to specify which sense you're using the word justice. That's one point to make. The fact, and, and the, the, there are other words. Uh, if you were not to use any word um, 
uh, you know, they would have more than one cent, then I think you would have great difficulty. You can't for, ask for hot tea because that might mean chili tea. Uh, and there are all kinds of words which have more than one cent, but you have to make, I don't mean chili, I do mean not cold. Uh, so I think once you explain, then people understand that. That's the first one. The second point is there's a huge tradition of talking about justice in the form in which uh, the theory of justice addresses it, either in the form of perfect justice or in the form of enhancement of justice, going back to Plato and Aristotle and so on. Um, and um, the, um, I don't think um, Hobbes and Kant and, and um, in our time Rawls and and Nozick were making a mistake in using the word justice in that grander sense, not in the purely legal sense. Uh, and indeed, even some legal thinkers, um, like, um, well, Dworkin himself would be one, but Hart too, I had the privilege of giving the Hart lecture about two months ago in Oxford. It was quite striking how often he brings in justice in the other sense in his discussion, not in the legal sense. So you have to make clear what is it you're doing and I wanted to draw on the huge literature, both uh, you know, Smithian, Mary Wilson, Craftian type, as well as the Kantian, Hobbesian kind. So that's the, the second reason. The third is that I even though the word justice in today's world is sometimes used in a kind of much narrower way, sometimes even more narrow than you, than you have been suggesting here, namely, not just in terms of legal, but when you say, you know, somebody had murdered and you, ultimately you catch this guy and he is executed, if he's in America, and particularly in Texas, and <laughs> with or without public jubilation, and you say, why are you jubilating? Because I'm jubilating that justice is ultimately being done. That's a, not only the legal sense, but also a very, very much a narrow legal sense. And that's also a use. But the fact is that a lot of the world, when people worry about injustice, they are worried about big things as well. And justice is a big thing. I happen to end my first uh, introduction by uh, a quote from Seamus Heaney about justice. And I happen to have, I was in, um, I was getting a degree as it happened in the Queen's University. And I was very touched there, and in, in, that was in uh, Belfast. I was very touched that uh, Seamus Feeney and, and, um, and Mari came over for the occasion. And he's, he said he read the book, of course, where he's quoted, but he also pointed out that where Yeats talks about what we need, really need is reality and justice. I didn't know that line. He gave me the reference. So I think the grander sense has been used and continues to be used. It has great power. I don't want to give it up. And even though I would like the word sen to have magical power, I don't think it has quite achieved that state. But so, thank you for being suggestion. And uh, uh, someday uh, I might uh, decide that the word sen would have been better, but I rather doubt it. There's a question right over the corner on the right. It had magical power during my university studies, so thanks very much, Professor Sen, for that. My name is Matthew Smith. I work for a consultancy firm. I've just got quite a simple question drawing on some of your earlier work and wondering whether global justice is automatically enhanced um, by giving more aid to developing countries. Uh, no, the answer to that is, is in short, no. Um, because, um, but that is the different question from saying, can aid be helpful for for global justice? The answer to that is yes. So it depends. And you can find a cluster of examples. Um, what's the guy, Magnata, uh, the, um, the author of um, uh, White Man's Burden? Uh, what? East East Eastern, East yeah. I mean, he gives lots of examples where AIDS had done a tremendous amount of harm. And planning had done a tremendous amount of harm. And he uh, therefore giving on the basis of this example, and, and, and they're very good examples, it's a very good book. I, I reviewed it uh, in, the, in, in, in the Foreign Affairs and, and taught people to read it. 
But they then come to the conclusion that therefore no planning would be best. But that's not quite the case either, because planning had done a lot of good too. I did take the liberty of calling the review article the man with no plan. Uh, and I think that conclusion is what I'm resisting, not his example. Those are good examples where aid has done harm. But there are a lot of other examples given. And there are books in there. I, think. I guess Robert Casson's book is now old fashioned. But there have been a lot of books to indicate cases where it had made a big difference positively. Chandra. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Chandran Kukathas from the Department of Government um, at LSE. Um, I want to raise a question Close about <coughs> your relationship. Proximity. Account. Sorry, I want to raise a question about your account of the relationship between justice and injustice and, and to raise a worry about, about justice. Uh, the, the question is whether um, addressing injustice is um, uh, the same thing as doing justice. And the, and the worry is that um, uh, trying to do justice or making justice an important standard is that it sets a very high bar in the following sense, that those who feel that they have not had justice done uh, for them uh, feel aggrieved um, in a way that, say, they may not feel aggrieved if they feel you know, that they were never going to get justice, but at least they were going to get, say, for example, the mitigation of their condition in some way. In some ways, um, I'm trying to suggest people would be um, better off and conditions might be um, uh, more secure, um, happier in many ways, if we didn't put too much emphasis on justice because justice Either is justice a source of injustice. conflict, yeah. basically. That's, that's the issue. Yeah. Um, again, a good question, but I, I, I would think that um, um, <clears throat> there is an asymmetry between justice and injustice in this respect. Even those who say, look, Justice has not been done to all those groups. Slavery has been abolished. But the fact is that still, uh, there are all kinds of ways in which the world is imperfect, unequal. It's often not recognized that Karl Marx, in the Capital Volume 1, when he discusses whether there is anything good happening in the world, he's fairly pessimistic there. And he said there is, in fact, one thing. And you might think that he's talking about Paris Commune, but he doesn't. He said it's the abolition of slavery in the American Civil War is the only good thing that's happened in recent years. So he welcomed it. But did he think that that is, that justice is being done? No. He continues to talk about wage slavery that would apply to capitalist enterprises. But he did think it was a big step, gigantic step. And therefore he was being quite consistent with his own comparativist reasoning, that these people are all brought up in Smithian line of reasoning, Mill, Marx, um, and, and, and they, they are comparativists. And in that context, removal of injustice can take place without claiming that justice has been done to everybody. I think the, the force of injustice, this question came up earlier, the force of identifying something as, do you agree it's a, it's a remediable and a huge injustice? And if you agree, there is something to be done there. And, and, and that is a big force. It's not like saying, on humanitarian grounds, should we do something? No. It's much more strong than that. And I don't want to give that up on grounds that the idea of perfect justice puts us into a little bit of a prison from which we cannot escape. Um, are you right to continue for a few minutes? Sure, absolutely. Right. Excellent. Lady over there. Françoise Bouchek from Queen Mary, sorry, right here, formerly from the LSE. If the meaning of global justice is the outcome of a process of public reasoning, presumably because it is culture bound, but does that mean that justice is not a universal concept? No, not a, not a what concept? I think universal. Could you, could you could you just yeah. Yeah. It is a universal concept. Yeah, I think that, you know, the moment you say that you could have reasoning across borders, you're accepting a certain universality about it. And um, namely that if you say that, you know, in our region we don't believe it, if you want them to say, look, your region, you don't believe it, and then there is a way of lazy solution 
which often goes by the name of tolerance, which I think is a complete misnomer, which is to say, look, maybe you're right in your region, I'm right in my region, let's not quarrel about this. I mean, that is to um, avoid the quarrel, but to give reasoning no role at all. The right question to ask is, if you claim that this is in your region, why is it right in your region? Is it because there's some special things in your region, like it being a hot country and therefore appearing in public uh, without adequate coverage, maybe uh, without what would be regarded as appropriate in London, with or without a tie, is all right? Well, then, of course, there is a reason you have already given. Or if you say that, no, it, it just we happen to believe that, here we happen to believe that genital mutilation is fine. Uh, then I think there is a requirement to say, why is it fine? Why doesn't the argument hold against it? It's not an occidental argument against an oriental uh, or African custom. It is an argument that can be addressed by anybody and has to be addressed by anybody. And um, the, um, I do recommend the theory of moral sentiment because the book is full of examples of that kind from Chinese foot binding uh, to, uh, to, to Athenian infanticide. But the interesting point, of course, of Smith is, and that's a technique of reasoning, that when he wants people to be convinced, he doesn't go for Chinese foot binding because he thought that a lot of people around him in Glasgow and Scotland and London would find that the Chinese could do lots of things which we won't accept. But Athens, my God, that's what they read in public schools all the time. The, the highest respectable area. It's not the barbarians at the gate. And if they did something, and we now know that that's a mistake, and we know because we have thought more about it, we don't believe that it's necessary for the survival of a society, there is a reasoning that's owed. And that really means the idea of global justice does have a universality in to engage in such reasoning. And that's really, I, I could have said a few more things, but I think David wants me to get on. I can see that every now and then he's looking at me. So, <laughs> well, so, I, I, so I, I think I'll get on, but thank you. You're doing well. I, I, uh, yes, there's a, there are a couple more questions, and I perhaps in the end will come back to a question myself. Yeah. yeah. Will, Kenny, I was... Um, where, where are you? I'm here, sorry. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, was, uh, I was curious at how I should... Um, should rationalize the, the endorsement, obviously, for, for democracy and reasoning and, and, and sounds and <laughs> institutions with the self-interest that, that politicians are obliged to, um, to really sell to voters when, when, when they are um, d d d d attempting to achieve power and the short-termism that appears to be becoming ever, ever more prevalent in, in politics and how that's at odds, really, with the quest for global justice. Yeah, well, it, 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 it's not a great con contributor to global justice. The more thoughtful and it is, harder it is to get the perspective of global justice into the story. And that's one of the reasons why I was telling David that um, democracy has its own discipline, which may or may not be conducive to justice in every case, even though ultimately public reasoning, which is the central issue in uh, democracy in the Emilian perspective, um, is in fact quite, uh, really quite central to understanding of global justice. And I think the, um, there is a question about short run and long run, and if you have to have mechanisms when there is not complete agreement, you have to have majoritarian or some other way of resolving conflict, and you may end up in a situation where short-term considerations tend to get a lot more importance than they should. I think, in a sense, that's the trap in which President Obama is captured at the moment because the short run, the elections are coming in November. He has to do a lot of things which would not be in, the, in his view also, and we know his view because he stated them before, is not in the long run interest. But on the other hand, he does want a democratic Congress. So he has to make compromises. These are compromises which may be completely legitimate on democracy, but not legitimate on grounds of pursuit of justice, legitimate on grounds of some kind of process fairness and impartiality in dealing with unanimity in, in not a perfectly good way. But this may be the best that we can do. That's the kind of reasoning which makes the short run argument tend to be privileged. And we know that that could make a very big difference. I would say here 
also bringing the short-run perspective into scrutiny from a long-run perspective does make a difference. I'm mean, giving an example from India. There was a time when it did look that the that the um, the um, Hindutva movement, the the politicized Hindu movement, was gaining ground, and they very often concentrated on very short-run issues, on very long-run ground, construction of a mosque somewhere, some in South... Temple, not mosque. Temple, not mosque. Sorry? Construction of a temple and destruction of a mosque. Destruction, oh, uh, oh the destruction of a mosque, did I say? Oh my God, I didn't mean. Destruction <laughs> of a temple carried out allegedly in 16th century to be now replaced by a mosque and so on. And, but the, the, the thoughts on issue was the construction of the mosque now. But that's basically gone away now, basically. Even the Hindu poly political party don't emphasize that. Because the focus on global development, and I think that's one of the good things and that's happened in India, how big development has become in the perspective. And I think in, in that respect, India has got lucky in some ways that Pakistan is not, because it's still not captured in the dialogue about development. And I think it makes a very big difference, despite the fact that Pakistan civil society is very active, and there are extraordinarily courageous people there, running newspapers, running human rights organizations, but they haven't been able to shift yet, partly because of the way the history of the country has gone from the period of Zia onward. But I think this is something which has to happen. But the short and the long run thing comes in. So there is a handicap there, but on the other hand, for democracy, I don't see how you can avoid that, other than continuing engagement in debate. Well, we have 10 more minutes to, <coughs> to go. I'd just like to, I'm um, just inviting Meghna to, to see whether Meghna Desai has any reflections on this discourse of justice. Okay, uh, I'm going to go back to something which was asked before about justice versus fairness. And I would say, uh, in someone like Hayek, the notion is that there is commutative justice and distributive justice. And Hayek would say, I'm not concerned with distributive justice because it's impossible to have a, have a proper analysis of distributive justice. So he will only stick to commutative justice. You are entirely concerned with distributive justice. And commutative justice doesn't play any part in your in your Communicative justice. Uh, commutative justice, yes. Commutative justice. Commutative yeah. justice. Yeah, that's a technical Hayekian term, of course. Yeah. You know, I think there are many people have different distinctions. I gathered when I visited Bangladesh last what my real distinction was, as Raman Sovan, who was chairing the meeting, said the real distinction is that he is the author of the only book on pure philosophy that has ever been pirated in Bangladesh. <laughs> Since you can buy it for, uh, I can see... Um, Stuart Prophet sitting at the back. And it's not good news for Penguin. You can buy it basically for 90p, <laughs> equivalent of whatever number of takas that means. Uh, and that is my distinction. Um, Meghna's distinction, he's the only one who is simultaneously a Marxist and a Hayekian. Uh, <laughs> and he therefore is able to use these things. But some of us, and since I'm neither, uh, though I'm somewhat more influenced, I'm actually influenced by both. Midnight may find it difficult to believe there are parts. Actually, I do quote high quite a bit, in my, even in my so-called, my probably the most discussed paper, namely The Impossibility of the Poet in Liberal, the state reference to Hayek there, with which it starts, and Mill. But the, I don't the commutative has passed me by, so I don't know whether what I've missed out, but if you would explain to me, um, maybe later, not. later, maybe. later. Okay, then we will take it on from there. <laughs> L let me ask just a last question. I'm sorry, we're 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 close to time, and it's uh, a slightly different emphasis now. Um, the, 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 and I'd like to ask you about the role of the UN, really, um, something which you've considered elsewhere, uh, but it's relevant to this promotion of a global public dialogue and the importance of public reasoning at the global level. The UN was founded, of course, under very different circumstances to those of the present. Uh, power is drifting rapidly to the east. The UN is, in some sense, is neither representative nor sufficiently funded, as it were, to be an effective agent of public discussion at the global level or to be able to intervene in many areas effectively. And I just wonder what, 
follows from your book and the kind of emphasis you make both on justice and the importance of public reasoning for thinking about the UN system today. Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, I'm a great supporter of the United Nations, but I'm also realist enough to recognize its limitation. Uh, and um, I think Americans haven't helped in making the United Nations possible. I think under Obama, we probably had the most pro-UN presidency that we have had for a long time. Um, but the UN has not had that role in the world, particularly given the importance of America and the importance of America for funding too. Mm -hmm. And it's quite important. I think that ne nevertheless some of the UN organizations do a lot of good work, particularly putting issues into, into perspective. I think um, issues about um, gender inequality, issues about human development, Mm -hmm. uh, our friend Mabuk and my, Ma, uh, Magnus and my common friend Mabul Haq did a huge amount. So it has done a lot of contribution. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's not been able. When I was studying um, famines, which I spent about 15 years doing, I was struck that in any of the major African famines, where they don't, you know, the famine only about, in the Bengal famine, which is the first one I started, less than 10% died of hunger. It, uh, the starvation. They die of diseases, standard diseases, which are actually encouraged by the famine. Lack, lack of immunity, reckless lifestyle, reckless eating, uh, and you die of cholera, you die of smallpox in those days, you die of malaria, and so on. And so in many cases in Africa, we didn't know what people were dying of. And I found how the diagnosis came. They almost invariably tried to get the WHO interested, never got it. I didn't find a single case where the, where the diagnosis came from them. It came from a national institution, namely American, namely Center for Disease Control. Mm -hmm. It was the Center for Disease Control doing something which is not part of their standard work because it's an American institution. It actually ended up diagnosing them. So, but I think this makes two points. Why being limited by found funding makes a big difference and that's the direction to look at, to expand. Uh, there is also a leadership issue, and UNESCO raises that question every now and then, as I've already mentioned. But I think funding is a big thing. But the, the other question is to recognize that even non-UN bodies could help. I think the Center for Disease Control has been a huge boon to the, to the developing world, and continues to be today. So I think in all kinds of ways, organizations which are not meant for global justice end up having a role. And we should be pragmatic en enough to recognize where contributions are coming from and the fact that global justice pursuit of removal of injustice may come from organizations which are not dedicated to that purpose at all, but could have that effect. So we have to have that catholicity uh, in our mind. Thank you. Well, it remains for me then to say two things. One, to remind you that since uh, Marcia Sen is going to sign books, I'll ask you all to stay seated till he's, till he's left. And then it, it remains for me, of course, to thank you. But we can't just thank you for being here this evening, and we can't just thank you for your book. I think everyone is here has been inspired by your work over a very long period of time. You have contributed massively to academic life across the world and to the development of practical politics. And for that, in the most profound sense, I would like to thank you on behalf of everybody here. Thank you.